Okay, hello, good evening, everybody, and thank you so much um, for coming uh, to our seminar this evening. Um, as you know, we're here to talk about the a decision from um, Strasbourg uh, of the case of VCL and AN in the UK, which was um, handed down on the 16th of February this year. Um, that case was about two unconnected applicants, both Vietnamese nationals and children at the relevant time who were discovered by the police to be working in cannabis factories. And they were charged with being concerned of the production of a controlled drug. Um, whilst a uh, VCL was not initially referred um, into the NRM um, as a potential victim of trafficking. The competent authorities subsequently determined that he had been trafficked. Um, the CPS disagreed with that assessment and pursued his prosecution as well uh, as um, ANs who, who had a post-conviction uh, positive conclusive grounds decision. In any event, um, the VCL and AN were convicted in 2009 and their appeals were rejected in 2012 and VCL tried again in a case um, called Joseph and others in 2017 um, but was unsuccessful which was why uh, they both went um, uh, up to Strasbourg. Uh, although much has changed since 2009 including the CPS's legal guidance in human trafficking, slavery and smuggling and the Home Office's statutory guidance uh, to the 2015 Modern Slavery Act. Um, the Court of Appeal here, uh, the criminal division, is still regularly troubled by unsafe convictions in this field. Um, so we are yet to see what approach the Court of Appeal will take to this judgment in the future. Um, it is the first occasion on which the Strasbourg court has been called upon to consider if and when a case concerning the prosecution of a victim or potential victim of trafficking might raise an issue under Article 4 of the European Convention of Human Rights. So um, we have uh, put together a, a team of people, two of whom uh, were involved in the litigation itself, <clears throat> to speak to you about their views uh, from different backgrounds of the implications of this judgment and how um, we think this might play out uh, in the litigation that we are all involved in relating to traffic victims. So the first person um, who is going to um, kick off for us is Rabba. Um, and he is a rising star, uh, a young rising star and member of our criminal team. Uh, he routinely uh, represents victims of trafficking subject to criminal proceedings uh, at the pre-trial pre stage in the criminal courts at the trial stage. And he uh, often advises on appeals and, um, uh, uh, and has been involved in seeking public law uh, relief uh, where necessary. So Robert's going to try and tell you about how he thinks this judgment um, has or will affect uh, the domestic court's approach um, to victims of trafficking who are caught up in the criminal justice system. He's also going to try to look at what the Lord Chief Justice said in the recent case of DS and see whether um, there's anything that was said by Strasbourg which may um, uh, cast doubt on that decision or not. So um, over to you, Rubber. Right. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Maya, for the kind and slightly embarrassing introduction. And um, thank you also, everyone, to, um, for attending this seminar. Um, over about the next 15 minutes, I'm going to cover three subheadings. Uh, the first is what are, in a nutshell, some of the key takeaways from BCL and AN for practitioners who represent victims of trafficking who are subjected to criminal proceedings. Um, obviously, I'd recommend you read the judgment, but even if you didn't, hopefully I can capture some of the key takeaways from that judgment. The second area is what is precisely the current domestic approach in the United Kingdom 
Um, things have obviously moved on, as Maya indicated, since the cases considered in BCL and AN, including the CPS guidance, which is quite central to consideration of um, prosecuted victims of trafficking. Um, and third, thirdly, in what ways can BCL and AN be used or deployed to push your client's best interests in criminal proceedings? And there are ways to do that because of course, um, and, I, and I flagged this up very early on, the, um, one of the important things that BCL and AN does is it transposes an operational duty to investigate and protect victims of trafficking into Article 4, or rather flags up that this Article 4 contains that obligation. Um, and if our domestic courts agree that Article 4 should be interpreted in that way, it means that Section 6 of the Human Rights Act kicks in um, and public authorities can't act in contravention of that duty and you have um, pretty solid relief when they do. Um, so first, the key takeaways of BCL. As Maya said, the cases concerned um, Vietnamese children, 15 and 17 years old respectively, who were trafficked into the United Kingdom and then exploited to assist in cannabis cultivation. Um, the facts, um, I would say, are particularly harrowing when you consider the ages of the defendants, um, as they then were, and the treatment of them by law enforcement and the Crown Prosecution Service. Uh, and as Maya mentioned, a number of agencies, including what's now the single competent authority, found or eventually found conclusive grounds um, that both victims, both um, defendants as they then were, 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 were victims of trafficking in line with the definition in the Palermo Protocol or the Anti-Trafficking Convention. And briefly, that consists of three components. I'm sure most of us will be familiar with that. And it's the act first, which is the act of recruitment, transportation, transfer, harboring, or receipt. So a victim of trafficking is um, maintained in one of those ways or elicited into the activity in one of those ways. Second, means, so threat or force or any other form of coercion. And third, for the purpose of exploitation. Uh, and a good way to think of exploitation is uh, that who receives the benefit from the activities being undertaken by the victim of trafficking, if it's someone in a position of power, or someone using them, or disproportionately taking advantage of their services, or the services are criminal and therefore by their nature underpaid, um, then uh, for, for the person at the forefront, then it, it's likely it's exploitation. For a child, of course, as VCL and AN were at the time, the second component means is, is not required. A child cannot consent to their exploitation. So th there's no need to demonstrate that element. It, in any case, the Crown Prosecution Service um, and the Court of Appeal later on decided that despite the conclusive grounds findings by expert agencies, set up to investigate precisely this question, um, these two Vietnamese children were not victims of trafficking. And so both appealed under Articles 4 and Article 6, um, saying to, to Strasbourg, saying their, Strasbourg saying their rights had been violated. And very briefly, drawing out what the conclusions were under Article 4 and then Article 6, the court found first under Article 4, for, for the first time having considered this, that there is a, a, a positive obligation under Article 4, the prohibition on slavery and forced labor, to identify, investigate, and protect victims of trafficking. And by investigate, investigate situations of potential trafficking. So there's an obligation on state agencies to ensure that all three of those components are completed. Um, and that obligation bites when, and this is paragraph 152 of the judgment, state authorities are aware or ought to have been aware of circumstances giving rise to a credible suspicion that an identified inv individual had been or was at real and immediate, immediate risk of being trafficked or exploited within the definition that was outlined earlier. Um, and for those of us who practice crime or various aspects connected to the Article 2 operational 
um, duty, think of it like a, an Osman notice. So if someone's life is in danger or there's a credible suspicion to suggest someone's life is in danger, the police are under a duty to notify them and investigate to prevent the loss of life that may arise. Um, and it's, it's a similar, the courts frames it in a very similar kind of operational slash investigative duty. So uh, that, that's the, the duty the court found for the first time. And it's crucial, obviously, because now it's arguably part of Article 4, or it is part of Article 4, um, whether it, our domestic courts agree as well remains to be seen. Um, but that positive obligation should form part of Article 4. One of the key aspects for criminal practitioners when raising these issues is what is, quote, a credible suspicion? Where does that arise so that the Article 4 duty then bites? Um, and what the Strasbourg judgment does is it relies very, very heavily on the state's own guidance. So the Home Office and the National Crime Agency publish guidance on um, victims of trafficking and modern slavery and how trafficking indicators are framed and how they engage with um, certain people in certain circumstances. Um, and there is a plethora of guidance on county lines suggesting when trafficking indicators arise in those circumstances or Vietnamese children in cannabis factories and farms. So those are all important pieces of literature which criminal practitioners should have regard to when arguing there's a credible suspicion that someone is a victim of trafficking. And we know, unfortunately, that um, the, this guidance is um, routinely published, but also routinely, unfortunately, ignored um, when prosecution decisions are made. So when that credible suspicion arises and the steps to investigate or protect are not followed up on, a violation of Article 4 occurs. And that's the, the, the means by which the court suggests the investigative obligations should be actioned, or one of the means, is paragraph 160 of the judgment, he or she, the potential victim of trafficking, should be assessed promptly, so no delay, by individuals trained and qualified to deal with victims of trafficking. And in the United Kingdom, that's of course national referral mechanism process and a single competent authority. Paragraph 161 goes on to say that in, in, a, in particular, in the criminal context, the individual's status as a victim of trafficking may affect whether there's sufficient evidence to prosecute or whether it's in the public interest to do so. And so actually this investigative duty kicks in um, where possible or insofar as possible before the prosecution decision is taken. So it's not good enough for a judge in the Crown Court or a prosecutor to say, well, well just enter your pleas today and we'll figure it out later. Um, this investigative duty forms part and parcel of the investigative and dis prosecutorial decision-making process. So it needs to be completed before you're entering pleas or deciding whether you're going to go to trial. I mean, it's important to flag that up because case management often um, overtakes these principles which we've laid out to protect certain vulnerable people. Um, and it's important for defence advocates in particular and defence solicitors to ensure that what's happening is meant to happen in the, in the best interest of their client. And VCL and AN is very clear on that. Um, the judgment goes on, paragraph 162. Once a trafficked per trafficking assessment has taken place um, and a conclusive grounds decision is achieved that the person is a victim, victim of trafficking, and this is crucial, whilst the prosecutor might not be bound by the findings made, they would need to have, quote, clear reasons which are consistent with the definition contained in the Palermo Protocol to disagree that the person is a victim of trafficking or decide that they're not a victim of trafficking. Now that's um, really remarkable because in this case, in VCL and AN, the CPS came up with a number of reasons why they said that the um, person was not a victim of trafficking despite the conclusive grounds. They suggested that the person had a mobile phone and they could have escaped, they had money. Um, the offences were very serious. Um, the Strasbourg court found that none of those 
were clear reasons for disagreeing with the conclusive grounds decision. In fact, those were peripheral issues, not relevant to the tests, to the test rather, um, of determining whether someone's a victim of trafficking. And that's paragraphs 166 to 171. And there's quite a good discussion about this. Um, I, I call them the myths of um, deciding someone is not a victim of trafficking. And they, they often correlate to um, defenses or, or sort of responses by the prosecution when you run a defense of duress, which completely misunderstands the circumstances of someone who is extremely vulnerable and may not have the capacity to make the decisions that um, someone not in their circumstances would be able to make. Um, and so in a nutshell, if the police or the CPS fail to investigate first, after credible suspicions arise on their own guidance, and that, um, in my view, is not that difficult to show. There are very clear cut um, indicators of trafficking. Um, or after conclusive grounds do not give clear, or if the CPS after conclusive grounds do not give clear, in brackets, good reasons for not treating someone as a victim of trafficking, they are acting in breach of the operational obligation under Article 4. So, that means, and the judgment points it out, if the CPS agree that the person's a victim of trafficking, but they decide that there isn't a nexus between the offence and the um, trafficking, that is not, they have completed their operational duty because they've recognised the person's a victim of trafficking, but they've made a decision based on other factors, so a disconnect between the offending and the, and the trafficking. So it's really about disagreeing with a trafficking uh, with a trafficking body after an investigation without giving a good reason that breaches the operational duty. So that's that's Article 4. Um, Article 6 was the other ground and very briefly, um, because if I go on I'll go over my time, um, there's a right to a fair trial and the court came to the conclusion, paragraph 196, that evidence concerning an accused status as a victim of trafficking is a fundamental aspect of their defense. And we would view it domestically as uh, in terms of the obligation to investigate reasonable lines of inquiry um, that assist the defense case or undermine the prosecution case. If someone is likely or there's a credible suspicion they're a victim of trafficking, that fundamentally assists their case to the extent that failing to undertake those investigations can result in a violation of Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights because they've not had a fair trial because a fundamental aspect of their defence has been missing. Um, and paragraph 200 is where the court comes to the conclusion that lack of securing an NRM referral um, could result in uh, uh, the defendant failing to be secured with evidence which may have constituted a fundamental aspect of their defence. So that's that's the, the, the key takeaways, I would say, from VCL and AN, the current approach of our criminal courts is um, set out in, just give me a moment, the current approach in our criminal courts is set out in the four-stage test, which uh, it is set out in the CPS guidance and has recently been um, confirmed in RNDS because I want to move to some of the ways you can deploy VCL and AN. I'd recommend for those who aren't familiar with the four stage test, you just um, take a look. It's a fair, fairly explanatory process the Crown Prosecution Service have to go through to decide whether to prosecute a victim of trafficking. And it includes the guidance that the uh, where there's a suspect that might be a victim of trafficking, prosecutors should have their regards to making reasonable inquiries, including the NRM referral. Um, and the CPS guidance, Maya's just told me, is in the, in the chat if you want to link to it. Um, they have to make those inquiries as soon as possible, so as soon as they arise. And in fact, they must be advising law enforcement agencies to make those inquiries as well um, through an NRM referral if that hasn't already been done. And that must be undertaken even if there's an indication of a guilty plea. So the CPS already have all of this guidance and they must comply with it according to their own rules. 
Um, and RNDS at paragraph 41 says that the CPS guidance correctly represents the CPS's um, legal obligations. So it's, it's not just guidance, it's, it's, it's law, it, it's compulsory. Now, what difference does VCL and AN make? If it's right that the operational obligation, which is in fairly similar terms actually to the CPS guidance, the new four stage test, is in fact an operational or positive obligation as part of Article 4 as well. What that means is through Section 6 of the Human Rights Act, the CPS are also bound under the Human Rights Act not to act in contravention of that positive obligation. Um, and it makes it just that much easier to challenge the CPS where they say they're not acting in accordance with their guidance. And you don't have to rely on irrationality or unlawful, well, arguably can rely on unlawfulness, but th there's ways to um, suggest flexibility within the guidance that just doesn't exist within the Article 4 um, operational obligation, which is quite robust. Um, so bearing that in mind, obviously the other issue with the current domestic um, structure is that there's way too much reliance on the CPS and police decision making to decide if credible suspicion exists, um, and secondly, to decide if the proceeding to the prosecution after conclusive grounds um, it is, it is okay. The final topic, practical ways to use VCL to push your client's best interest. And this is where I end. I'm going to try to do it inside one minute because I've been told that's time I have left. Um, seven, seven ways I'd say. Um, first, VCL and AN is a comprehensive judgment. Um, the court's assessment is very, very lucid. It's very clear. It's very easy to read. And so we should be deploying this to CPS reviewing lawyers who um, more often than not, unfortunately, in my experience anyway, um, ha have not been properly informed of those aspects of their duties, um, or, or maybe they're, they're overworked and they don't have the opportunity to follow up. So it, it's important to just show them how it's set out. And it, it comprehensively sets out the guidance uh, and the relevant law, and including the previous Court of Appeal authorities domestically. Second, um, rely on guidance. Uh, national crime agency guidance, police guidance, home office guidance, to demonstrate that the credible suspicion threshold has been passed. It's routinely met, but the police either don't refer, refer because they say, well, he's not a victim of trafficking anyway, or the CPS don't. Refer them to their own guidance. Um, and that's the way the analysis sets out in BCL and AN. Thirdly, if there's a reason to, if the CPS say they're continuing a prosecution, um, ask for the reasons they're continuing a prosecution despite a, a conclusive grounds decision, those are disclosable and you should get a hold of them. If despite a conclusive grounds decision, fourth, the CPS refuse to acknowledge that an individual is a victim of trafficking without good reason, challenge this by way of an abuse of process. Um, DS is clear that the traditional grounds of abuse of process still survive improper prosecution. And now you have a chance to argue that prosecution is improper because the CPS haven't complied with their obligations under Article 4 um, to give good reasons or clear reasons um, that uh, the conclusive grounds decision should be ignored. Fifth, if the prosecution continues on lack of nexus or identified clear reasons consistent with the Palermo protocol, then the, the, the CPS have complied with their operational duty and that's um, unfortunately the end of it, although you have a defense under section 45 and trafficking can be mitigation. Um, sixth and penultimately, um, article six, the reasonable investigation, reasonable investigations for a fair trial uh, and compliance with disclosure obligations. Um, trafficking status is, is now remarked as a fundamental aspect of a defense and um, use that to push for uh, your, your investigative, um, the, the investigative steps you say should happen. Um, and in fact, there is a traditional abuse of process grounds on failure to investigate reasonable lines of inquiry. Um, is there an obligation? We say yes under Article 6. And second, are you prejudiced by that obligation not being followed up with? So use the case law under Article 6 that's been developed. Um, and lastly, and I end now, um, push because it's important you fight back against the myths that suggest someone is not a victim of trafficking. Fight the mis misunderstandings that are applied in this case um, uh, and uh, pull up on the um, criminalization of victims of trafficking where there's just no good reason to ignore that they are victims. Thank you.
Thank you so much, uh, Robert. You said um, that it's a, a, a clear judgment. I mean, some would say it's an excoriating criticism of the Court of Appeal criminal division, which uh, may, just may have the markings of our <coughs> of the English judge in Strasbourg, who knows? But um, uh, I think the, 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 the novelty in this uh, judgment is the way in which Article 4 uh, infects fairness. So then um, <coughs> Article 6.1 comes into play and we haven't seen that before. Of course, we'll talk more about uh, this later. Um, uh, what I'll do is introduce our next speaker, who is Xu Xin. Um, she's a public law practitioner. She is really well known for her expertise in the area of, of anti-trafficking and modern slavery. Um, she routinely acts for individuals in judicial review challenges to disputes over their status as victims of trafficking, uh, the level of support and other rights to protection that they should have. She also acts for individuals in private law claims for compensation against public authorities, companies and traffickers. Uh, she has been involved in key cases on the nature and scope of the prohibition against slavery under Article 4, both at the domestic and international levels, and that includes um, uh, representing Liberty um, on behalf of VCL as an intervener. Um, she was also uh, in Chowdhury in Greece, um, and in the domestic criminal law context, she acted as an intervener in Crown and Allen others, which is um, uh, one of the watermark uh, cases for victims of trafficking and for anti-slavery international in the Court of Appeal Criminal Division in VCL's second appeal, which is also known as uh, Crown and Joseph and others. Um, she was also junior counsel for the Air Center in the Supreme Court um, in MS Pakistan. Um, if, I, if I went on, uh, because Shushin has done so much in this field, I could um, take up her speaking time telling you more about it. So um, what she's going to do is look at the implications of VCL and AN for our understanding of the scope of Article 4 and to look at what that means in the context of damages claims brought under the uh, HRA. Uh, both in terms of possible defendants that you could bring those Article 4 claims against and the level of damages, which um, we, 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 we've seen in the, uh, the damages that were awarded in this case. And uh, Shushin will look to see whether uh, it's any different from the cases that are on Article 4 to date. So thanks, Shushin. Uh, thank you, Maya. Um, so Rob has looked at the key takeaways in the criminal courts, and I, I wanted to put the findings of VCL in the context of those of you who bring damages claims against public authorities. Um, the first part would look at liability and when it arises and against whom, and the second part I'll look at quantum. But before I do that, I mean, one of the things about VCL and AN that's so significant is it's actually the first case to consider Article 4 in the context of prosecution of potential victims and victims of trafficking. And even when such a um, prosecution may bring about an issue under Article 4, because all the previous cases that have come along um, have looked at complainants um, bringing claims against the state's shortcomings and deficiencies in prosecuting their traffickers. So you've got to extract from those principles um, key points um, under Article 4 that you can use if you're acting on behalf of someone who's a victim, but also treated by the state as a defendant. And, and none of them sort of, none of these cases address the culpability of the state where penalization um, crosses protection. And although the other thing that is, is important to put in context is that although the European court was keen to say this is not a case about systems duties, and because one of the primary issues that was um, advanced by both VCL and AN 
is that there is the Article 26 of ECAT non-punishment provision and that the state has to comply with that. I mean, Strasbourg was keen not to go into the systems issue, but if you look at the judgment carefully, what it highlights actually illustrates what is required for the system to actually function in a way that gives real and pr practical protection to um, victims of trafficking. So although it's not about a commentary on the system itself, it's about what, what what it takes to make the system actually function. So it's not enough to have measures. What does it take for those measures to function? And with that in mind, I think the first key takeaway for our purposes here is that early identification is paramount um, in terms of importance. It's not something we don't know already, um, but it's important as a judgment underlying its importance because what is significant about it is um, the finding by the court that if a trafficked victim, a trafficked individual is promptly and effectively identified at the outset, soon after encountered, um, they may very likely never enter the criminal justice system because their need for protection is identified at the outset and their liability be prosecuted, considered at a much earlier stage of the criminal law process. So you're not trying to unravel things, you're trying to prevent it from happening in the first place. So I think that's you know, the idea of early identification is significant in that context. Um, the second point is the timing of the operational duty. When does it actually arise? I mean, we know the typical formulation is whenever the state is or ought to be aware about the existence of circumstances giving rise to a credible suspicion that someone is trafficked. We know that um, victim self-identification is not required. This was implicit in Ratsev and Chowdhury. But it is actually made very explicit here, particularly in the context of the criticisms made of the Court of Appeal and the um, CPS and police, in fact, that posit a positive finding that self-identification is simply not required and particularly not required in the context of children. It confirms, um, helpfully, the position in domestic law following the Court of Appeals judgment in TDT, which was itself a very progressive judgment, making the point that you can belong to a class of persons who are frequently trafficked. Um, and the objective evidence points to that. For example, you're Vietnamese, you're a child, you're in a cannabis farm. That's credible suspicion in and of itself. It doesn't need more. Um, and it deprecates the idea that if the victim tells a different story about why they've come, for example, they've been smuggled, which I think is what AN said at the beginning, um, that they are therefore not credible um, or their accounts are inconsistent or they can't be trafficked. So in a very clear, crystal clear judgment, it, it, it highlights explicitly the non-requirement of self-identification. Um, and pinning down the time when Article 4 arises is important, particularly in, in, in these two cases, because um, the court, instead of focusing on what the police ought to have done, the focus here is on what the prosecution did do and didn't do. Um, and, and making the point that police failure to investigate doesn't absolve the Crown Prosecution Service from their own responsibilities of public authorities to act. I mean, the consequence of VCL and AN is that the very decision to prosecute, if made without compliance with the duty to ensure early identification, can it in and of itself amount to a violation of Article 4. So when you fail um, to identify, the consequence is you fail to allow the victim to secure the evidence necessary, um, which may constitute a fundamental aspect of their criminal defence. It's not just a fairness issue under Article 6, it's also a fundamental breach of Article 4. And what's really interesting, I think, from a damages point of view, is that the court sees this not as a procedural breach. It sees it as a breach of the operational duty to protect. Um, and what it says, the two points that it says that is really quite illuminating is it's axiomatic that the prosecution of victims of trafficking would be injurious to their physical, psychological and social recovery and could potentially leave them vulnerable to be being re-trafficked in the future. Um, not only would they have to go through the ordeal of a criminal prosecution, but a criminal conviction could create an obstacle to their subsequent integration into society. So it's linking for the first time in a very clear way, investigation 
and protection and operation. And I think that's quite an important thing because it, it, in doing so, it also reframes the CPS's obligations as not just about an exercise of a discretion as to whether to prosecute, but as a matter of a duty to protect. Um, in order for the prosecution to demonstrate respect for freedoms from uh, under Article 4, it's got to identify, it's got to ask the question, are you potentially a victim? Is there a credible suspicion? Um, because the status as a victim affects whether or not you can prosecute in the first place and also whether it's in the public interest. This therefore, I think, widens the potential culpability and responsibility of the CPS for a claim, um, a retrospective civil claim for a breach of Article 4. Um, and I was trying to think when I was doing this seminar preparation why there is a reluctance to go against the CPS. Um, and I think uh, possibly it's because we have all been focused on the prosecutorial discretion because all the line of case law that's followed be before this in the common law context is about the wide discretion on the prosecution, the court being reluctant to interfere with it. Um, but what the European court did was, I mean, A, it was quite critical of looking at it in this very narrow lens. It was very critical, as Maya mentioned, um, of the Court of Appeal for, for being very narrow in its um, view. Um, and what the court did here was take it right back to a rights-based lens of looking at the CPS decision-making as a public authority under the Human Rights Act. And I think that's a quite um, significant innovation. Um, in terms of the fairness issue in Article 6, I think Maya's entirely right that it's, it's a radical um, kind of finding because it links for the first time the possibility of a substantive breach of Article 4 impacting on fairness and um, fair trial rights. Um, and because of the way in which the failure to investigate and protect prevents a victim from securing the evidence to run the um, trafficking defense. Um, and what it also says is the availability of lawyers and their failures doesn't absolve the state. So it puts um, the duty to protect squarely in the state's um, box uh, that they are actually the ones who are most um, responsible and liable irrespective of any other actors contribution to the unlawfulness and what the european court did in being critical of the court of appeals approach because maya alluded to this but what i think is really important is they they took particular issue um, with uh, the court of appeals finding that you can't other than in the most exceptional case allow a defendant to advance fresh instructions to change their plea or change their case on an appeal against conviction. And what they said was such an approach would in effect penalize victims for not initially identifying themselves and allow the authorities to rely on their own failure to fulfill their duty under Article 4 to take operational measures to protect them. And I do think that that in itself sums up really um, the key takeaway from, from VCL. Because although the court was really reluctant to say, this is about non-punishment, th that in and of itself highlights the importance and the primacy of protection over prosecution. Um, just quickly on quantum, um, as Maya has alluded to it as well, um, the quantum here was 25,000 euros. Um, for both Article 4 and Article 6. And in typical Strasbourg fashion, it never really properly explains um, how it's arrived at it, but um, it's quite um, telling what it did say. So it looked at distress on account of criminal proceedings. It doesn't mention, um, but of course that must entail being remanded, being imprisoned, and it must be implicit in the context of distress that that all happened and that was all experienced by VCL. Um, the other thing that it says is um, the damages go to um, the distress and difficulties in VCL and AN facing obstacles on account of a criminal conviction. Again, it doesn't you know, make it explicit, but for, for example, in VCL and, and in AN, it was bound to happen as well. They were both subject to deportation proceedings as um, under um, immigration powers. Um, and so, so that sort of idea of investigation, uh, investigative failures having a knock on protection effect is quite reflective also in the award of damages. Um, and what's interesting is, although it was Article 4 and Article 6, 
damages. I mean, the Article 6 findings were, were in, in essence, parasitic on the findings on Article 4. So it really was a very um, forward thinking Article 4 operational award of damages, I think. Um, and what is significant also about it is it moves the case law domestically on quantum significantly beyond the OOO benchmark, which um, most of you might remember it was one of the first, it was the first domestic case on Article 4 of failure to investigate. It was brought by complainants against their traffickers um, and is about the police failure to investigate trafficking um, by, you know, victims complaining. Um, and it was framed entirely as a pure procedural breach. And the finding of a breach was a pure procedural investigative breach. Um, the query whether or not that would make a difference if you framed it now as an operational breach and an operational protection duty um, and, and look at the consequences beyond investigation, perhaps not because of that, that particular case on its particular fact was very much about the police culpability rather than all the other consequences that flowed from that. And, and when I went back then and used this opportunity to look at all the other awards in the key Strasbourg cases, if you look at Ransev, um, it was 40,000, but it was a situation of death and Article 2 breaches. CN in France, it was 30,000, but it included pecuniary and non-pecuniary. Um, and the non-pecuniary asked for was 15,000. So this was, in essence, much more than that. CN in the UK was a pure, treated as a pure violation, procedural violation, even though it was about a defect in the criminal law, so arguably a systems breach, um, 8,000 euros. LE in Greece, detention, delays in protecting deficiency procedural obligations, 12,000. Chowdhury, 16,000. And the most recent case of SM in Croatia was a procedural breach of five grand. Um, so you could see where um, this case now sits in this context um, and, um, you know, it, it will give us a little bit more um, to bring us in line with sort of DSD benchmarks that we oftentimes use and try to draw analogy, analogy to from Article 3. Um, so, so I think this is quite helpful in pushing um, the potential of higher damages awards. Um, and just to wrap up um, some final words, um, in some ways, um, VCL is important because it affirms and it just adds to the line of cases that are gradually building up finally now in the European court level as to the scope of Article 4 duties. Um, but I think it's also in, so in that sense, from a ULA principle point of view for domestic courts, you know, you now have a, a, a long line of uh, cases interpreting the scope of Article 4, although obviously this is the first one looking at it in the prosecution, the nexus between prosecution and victimhood, but it's, it is about in the interpretation of Article 4. There is now a gradual development. It doesn't disagree with and in fact approves the previous cases. It just adds to it and says, well, this is also what it means. And what it means when you have early identification is X. And, and that, I mean, that's that's kind of, you know, how, how it is. Otherwise, you just have a whole load of cases repeating itself um, on the same principles without any development. But the other thing that is important about it, just to draw the strands together, is the connection between procedural and substantive obligations investigations not just being a procedural matter but have substantive implications and that that needs to be thought of in the context of breach um, explicit recognition of early identification explicit recognition of no self-identification and in essence although there was this desire to avoid getting drawn into non-punishment arguments the tenor of the judgment is about non-penalization about pro um, protection being paramount um, it doesn't preclude prosecution but it does highlight primacy of protection and the consequences of failing to do so. So from that perspective, these are lots of things that you can then use from a, a damages point of view, because damages are, it is a hard, it's a less difficult situation than the criminal court of appeal, because it's what has happened. It looks retrospectively rather than um, trying to fix something very particular in the domestic context. Um, so, um, with that, um, I'll end my presentation. Thank you, Maya. Brilliant. Um, Shushin, what I forgot to say when I was telling 
every about everybody about all the brilliant stuff you uh, you've done to date was to say that you've also contributed to a brilliant book and i'm going to plug it because i'm also a contributor um human trafficking modern law uh, modern slavery law and practice um, obviously, we highly recommend it to deal with these uh, nitty gritty issues, which obviously doesn't include uh, this judgment because, um, well, we published it this earlier this year and uh, not knowing when this judgment was going to come up. So I'm going to move on to our next speaker, but just to just to something that Chushin just said is we we have to take uh, what we can from this judgment uh, moving forwards given that it's in the criminal context it's 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 much uh, trickier in some ways to apply any principled decision making from it particularly as we are now um, in the world of the modern slavery act and the statute of defense under section 45 as opposed to the more discretion points uh, when we uh, just had Article 26 of ECAD or Article 8 of the EU Directive, or both of them um, together. But we'll um, talk about it uh, some more. So our next um, amazing speaker is Catherine. Um, she is a public law and human rights barrister here, and she specialises, uh, like Shushin, in anti-trafficking across a full range of issues. Uh, she has been involved in cases um, at all levels of the domestic courts and the and European and UN bodies, including, um, I'm going to give you a lot of acronyms here, Greta, uh, UNODC, CEDAW, UNICEF, and UN Special Procedures on Anti-Trafficking and Human Rights. Uh, and her connection with this case um, is that she acted for Anti-Slavery International uh, in their intervention in AN, working closely with another one of our wonderful colleagues, Dr. Anne Gallagher. Uh, she's a, uh, an academic panelist at Data Street. Um, so um, Catherine is going to give us some building blocks for the future um, to look at what we can take away in a wider public law context from this judgment. And she's gonna focus um, on the definition of, of trafficking and Strasbourg's approach to it, um, indicators of trafficking and how uh, you can apply an approach to, to, to those indicators in your practices, um, as well as uh, any lessons, um, any aspects of the case that you can use in general public law uh, challenges that you bring. So over to you, Catherine. Thank you so much, Maya, Rabba and Shushin for beautifully covering where next on Article 4 for victims in criminal and civil damages cases. Um, and huge thanks to everybody for joining. Now down to the business of this talk as Maya is a very hard taskmaster. Um, as Maya has explained, I'm going to talk about the where next and the reach of Article 4 for victims, mainly in public law cases, covering the two themes of the key principles of the case, um, the aspect of Article 4 engage the protection duty, definition, consent and indicators, and then how the principles can be applied in public law cases. I'm going to be that selective because of the time and because these issues are key to understanding the judgment, in my view, and to explain the importance uh, and, and why I'm taking this approach it, it, and the, why the court took that approach. The trafficking definition will often be the starting point for analysing a case. Um, particularly where you have a client who hasn't been identified and to figure out whether they meet the trafficking definition you will use the indicators of trafficking as a tool and as UNHCR has long said uh, the definition and the indicators are the starting point and that is the approach that the court has taken um, and if and before I start just another point if you haven't um, done so already I just want you all to put your trafficking glasses on, put your trafficking lens on, because this is the absolute heart of VCL. Um, as the case makes clear, if you don't put your trafficking glasses on, if you don't put your lenses on, you miss the point, you get it wrong. And this is what the authorities did in VCL and led to the breaches of articles four and six. Similar report made in PK Garner in the Court of Appeal. You have to look at a trafficking situation through the objectives of the convention.
And that is extremely helpful in every single case that you do. Now, with the glasses on, I can see everybody's done it. I'll start. <laughs> Sorry for that cheap, very cheap gag. So the first point, um, the key principles and themes arising from VCL and AN applicable in other cases, try not to repeat what has already been said. Uh, but <laughs> to take the point that's been made about the scope of Article 4, the normative point, because when the case was communicated by the Strasbourg Court, the court asked the parties to answer whether and if so how the non-punishment principle fell within the scope of Article 4 ECHR. And as we've been told and we know, there are three duties under Article 4, the systems duty, operational duty to protect, and the investigative or the procedural duty. And um, the court said the issue raised in this case was about the duty to protect. And we see that clearly from paragraphs 112, 113, and 160 to 162. But as is very, very, it, what's very important in this case is um, the court accepted the argument made particularly by Greta as an intervener that the duty to protect victims uh, encompasses the duty to identify. It's, and that is, as Greta pointed out, because to protect victims, it was of the utmost importance to identify them correctly, see paragraph 42. The court accepted this in full at paragraph 160 by reference to the trafficking definition. On to my second point, the trafficking definition. As I've said, it's the starting point to understanding what the judgment, um, how the judgment, um, how the findings of articles four and six were arrived at. And you see that through the structure of the judgment, starting at the legal framework in section two, paragraphs 94 to 107. It includes the article three trafficking definition in the Palermo Protocol including the lack of any requirement of consent for children and the irrelevance of consent for adults if other means are used. It then goes on to deal with the child specific rights under the UNCRC, which is the Lex Specialis for any children's case that, you you, you, that you're dealing with. Next, onto the ILO indicators, the International Labour Organization indicators of forced labour, which are based on the definition itself and which provide, quote, a valuable benchmark in the identification of forced labour and, tra and trafficking. So that's the court's judgment at 99. Um, Rai, if you don't mind putting a link to the ILO indicators, if you have a chance, that'd be brilliant. Thank you. This is all then wrapped up in the ECAT definition in Article 4, mirroring, mirroring Palermo, and the duties under ECAT to identify uh, under Article 10 and the Article 26 non-punishment principle, and also the Article 35 duty of cooperation between public bodies and civil society. The court applied all of that in the applicable principles at paragraph 158. Next, why did the authorities get it so wrong um, in, in the findings of the court? As we've heard, VCL and AN were both children found in a place of exploitation, both raised indicators of trafficking because of the situation and the circumstances they were in. Though they were both identified at various stages, um, including by the competent authority and the local authority, uh, they were treated by the CPS as, as not having been trafficked and um, particularly for AN as having been smuggled. And just to, to make the point here that of course, um, it, wasn't, it was, wasn't a big feature of the Strasbourg judgment, but they did note um, the CPS mistake in AN in treating him as being smuggled. And of course, it's the exploitative purpose, which is the key distinction between trafficking and smuggling in relation to the definition. The competent authority found that the exploitative purpose was met and um, given that he was found in a place of exploitation. So that was the definition satisfied. Um, so slight side point there, but one that actually had taken up quite a lot of the, 
um, focus of the CPS, but the court dealt with it, uh, or C CPS's attention, but dealt with quite neatly by the Strasbourg court. Both um, AN and VCL were advised that a defence, um, that a plea of duress would be unlikely to succeed, um, and the peripheral points focused on, um, as Rabba reminded us, was for VCL, due to his instructions about fear of his traffickers, and for AN, because he accepted that he could run away from the house that he was kept in. This was looking at their situation from the long, wrong um, uh, angle of the telescope. There was, there was this wrongly placed reliance on choice and constituted a myth, as Rabba has said. Having regard to the choice or consent of the child in coming into or staying in their situation or even doing the work that they were doing was a fundamental mistake and contrary to the trafficking de definition, which expressly states that children are re not required to show means through their lack of agency. They cannot choose, they cannot provide informed consent. See power 54 of the judgment. The trafficking definition was met because the children were recruited, transported, harboured for the purpose of exploitation through forced criminality or forced labour. And um, note that for adults under the trafficking definition, as I've said, consent is irrelevant if one or other of the means are used, such as an abusive uh, position of vulnerability, deceit, even if a victim initially consents to, to coming to the UK to work. And um, the court picked up, picked up on that and repeated its um, findings on that point, particularly in SM and Croatia and in Chowdhury. As we know, the UK Compton Authority accepted the children met the trafficking definition. Um, VCL had given a consistent account and AN, despite some aspects, um, nevertheless met the core components of the definition. He'd been recruited and transported for the purpose of labour exploitation and he was found in a place of exploitation which was guarded and locked from the outside and living conditions were consistent with those found in exploitative situations. See paragraph 33 of the judgment. Um, that then brings me on to my second point about the indicators of trafficking, because those are all indicators of trafficking, including being found in a place of exploitation. And given um, the situation that our clients are often found in, the, the first point of contact with the authorities, this is particularly important for any future um, case that you have where you need to challenge the failure to identify or investigate at the first point of contact, which is often then a mistake that's repeated through um, the processing of that person in the criminal or, um, or immigration or whatever. So the duty to identify and protect is on the authorities at the first point of contact. The indicators um, of trafficking are the flags or warning symptoms that are, um, are the, the indicators or apparent symptoms of that situation of trafficking and clusters or indicators around um, that situation can highlight concerns with the duty to circumstances experiences. And this is, this is, you get this from the court's um, analysis in both cases. So take VCL as an example. Both the competent authority and the CPS and the criminal courts were looking at this case and these indicators from entirely opposite ends of the spectrum. The UKBA, as it was, as competent authority, um, noted further indicators, including being found at a cannabis factory, highlighting criminality involving adults, not being enrolled in school, not being allowed to leave the property, and um, whilst mentioning his credible account, he'd remained consistent in various meetings he had had. The indicators of trafficking mentioned by the UK BA in the competent authority decision and recorded in the court's judgment, paragraph 13, are referral back to the NRM forms, the NRM referral forms. 
So if you are trying to figure out, if you're trying to think about indicators that haven't been spotted, you can often go to the NRM referral form for a child or an adult, which lists them all. And those indicators are the same or similar indicators used in the ILO list of operational indicators, which the court relied on and said they were important benchmarks for the um, identification and assessment of victims under the definition. Opposite end of the telescope, police and CPS, lens off, um, found he was, paragraph 18, the VCL, he was found in an ordinary house with a mobile phone, credit and money. In the trafficking assessment, he indicated his family was in Vietnam, not under threat, no debts owed to anyone in Vietnam, not abused prior to arrest, repeated at paragraph 45 in the summary of the case of the Crown. And the court found that um, that assessment by the CPS and the, uh, that had been before the Crown Court, repeated by the Court of Appeal, um, meant that the case had been approached in an ordinary way. He hadn't been spotted as a victim. And the court found violation because um, the CPS and the courts had not made a trafficking definition compliant assessment or provided clear legal reasons to depart from the assessment that had been made by the competent authority on the definition itself. And because of that, a breach of Article 4 was find, found and also a breach of Article 6. So, as I said, the, the key is that uh, the key to the competent authority decision was that the two elements of the trafficking definition were met, action and purpose, consent, uh, did not need to be shown and um, the CPS had not and the criminal courts had not provided a um, an assessment a clear legal reasons to depart from that which was compliant with the trafficking definition and that's why it's so important and you find that in paragraphs 163 and an even stronger um, articulation of that at 172, that despite being discovered in circumstances giving rise to a credible such, uh, suspicion, he was not a victim of trafficking, he was not referred to the NRM. And the court also noted evidence in the public domain, uh, including the CPS guidance and the CIOT reports regarding the situation, which, which provided, uh, bolstered the um, situational indicators that the applicants were in and also um, made the point about the barriers to disclosure that applicants will face um, including being threatened by their traffickers um, and also having psychological trauma. AN's case is, was stronger on that because well, not stronger on that just different because there was a psychological report as well. So um, the, 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 same, the same findings were made about the need for a trafficking compliant assessment um, at 172 paragraphs, 172 for, v, for, for VCL and for AN at 181. And the additional point for AN was it was not only his circumstances and his situation that gave rise to indicators of trafficking or that raised the concern of trafficking that should have been investigated. He had also gone on to raise in his account at interview indicators of trafficking that showed that he might have been a victim of trafficking. The court said that these concerns should have been intensified when it became apparent that he was a minor. See paragraphs 175 and 181. This all triggered the operational duty to protect and led to the finding of a breach of Article 4. Um, and um, on the Article 6 finding, see paragraphs 207 and 208, which is extremely strong. Um, and again, from the trafficking lens, on the trafficking lens point, to use a shorthand, the court is finding that the courts uh, the domestic courts did not put their Article 4 or Article 6 trafficking lens on. They missed the point. They took an overly narrow view, focusing on domestic criminal um, rules of criminal uh, procedure 
And that frankly skewed their whole assessment, uh, which was defective. And the decision they took, um, in fact, re-victimized the applicants in that, in, in that case. So paragraph 208 is particularly strong and can be used in a range of different cases. And then a third quick point uh, is on credibility and, the relate, and a very quick related point about evidence, including medical evidence. As I've already said, um, there was um, CPS and the Crown Courts held against the applicants, their failure to disclose and, and credibility issues, which were really peripheral. And the court just cut through all of that uh, in its analysis, but also went on to accept that in cases of victims of trafficking, there are clear and well-established barriers to disclosure. See paragraphs 170, 175 and 180. And um, for AN, as to the inconsistencies in his account held against him, the court went on to deal with the psychological report um, provided uh, that had been based on account on an account given to the NSPCC identifying post-traumatic stress disorder, major depressive disorder, and a supplemental report, um, which went on to say and reiterate that accounts given by potential child victims um, are rarely, but to different professionals over time in different contexts were rarely consistent with one another. So see paragraphs 37 and 38. And thank you, Rai has just um, put the link into a very important domestic case. Shushin was also involved in MN and IXU, which is um, a, a, it's a protection case fundamentally, um, but uh, really, really important. Well, protection and a conclusive, uh, it's about identification, but very important in terms of what it says about the approach to expert evidence. Catherine, you're way over time. Okay, I'm just gonna finish off. Um, thanks, Maya. Finish off by saying, where next? Where can these principles be applied and what types of cases can they be applied in? Answer to that is all of them. Uh, and because my time is up, I'll stop there. <laughs> and um, uh, But just to summarise, of course, these principles in VCL can be used as building blocks in a range of challenges to non uh, or no identification decisions, situations where a victim is wrongly criminalised, detained, unsupported, unprotected, age disputed, treated as a legal entrant, made subject to removal, the lot. So I look forward to discussion on that. I'm sorry for going way over my time. Uh, brilliant, thank you so much, Catherine. Um, it's just because I want to uh, have as much time as possible and we've only got 15 minutes left to take our questions um, from um, the uh, audience. And I can't promise to be able to answer all of them. So I'm gonna, uh, do my best uh, to uh, get as many as possible um, answered. So I just, there, there, there's a question from Shahzad about um, DPPMM and also about whether this, any sign of the CPS taking this case to the Supreme Court, um, obviously, they can't take this particular case to Supreme Court because it's not until it's back in the Court of Appeal Criminal Division. So the, the convicted, the convicted applicants would now have an opportunity to try and get their cases referred back to the CCRC, um, who would then have to decide whether to send it back to the Court of Appeal Criminal Division. And certainly for VCL, if that were to happen, that would be third time, let's hope, uh, lucky. Um, but who knows? Um, as to whether or not um, the Supreme Court will be grappling uh, with this decision, it would rather depend on um, which case is first before the Court of Appeal, I would I would think. And, and uh, my instinct is, uh, Shahzad, your second question about DPP and M and it being settled law, um, I, I would rather I rather suspect that case um, 
that the CPS is trying to appeal. Uh, and because that was a case stated, that will end up leapfrogging um, up to the Supreme Court if they get permission, at which point um, I have little doubt that um, the decision in this case will be brought to bear uh, and determined in some way um, by the Supreme Court. So it's we're yet to see what will happen. So I'm now going to move on to some more specific uh, questions. And um, uh, Shushin, here's one I think um, uh, for you. For modern slavery claims of labor exploitation, we commonly see there needs to be a demonstration of menace of penalty to be, pres to be present in order to reach the threshold of, of a reasonable grounds decision. Is the menace of penalty only needed to be present in forced labor claims or also in trafficking claims? Um, the formulation of menace of penalty comes from a very old Strasbourg case um, called Fendom Musil, not Muscle. <laughs> um, and uh, it's, it, it, it was considered in the context of, I think, a pupil barrister or lawyer, a pupil lawyer um, claiming forced labour in the way that he, he was um, required to work. Um, and menace of penalty, the, the sort of converse, of, the, the flip side to menace of penalty is sort of whether or not you've consented to do the things that you've been asked to do. And so from my perspective, if you put that forced labor context into the trafficking definition, then really it is just another means of exploitation rather than something on top of um, the three step ingredient of the definition that um, Catherine looked at. Um, so I, I think the CPS guidance and the trafficking guidance generally, where it talks about it being an additional thing, I'm not myself convinced that that is correct. I think menace of penalty is nothing more than another form of coercion or, you know, force, force um, of sorts um, to require yeah. someone to be exploited, you know. Yes, I, I, yeah, that, that, that makes perfect um sense. Um, we've got a lot to get through, so I'm going to um, move on. And I'm just going to read out a comment from, from Bernie Gravett, who's here. Hi, Bernie. Um, just to say, he says that in relation to the recording of a crime under the Modern Slavery Act, the Home Office counting rules state that as soon as an NRM achieves a reasonable grounds decision, a crime must be recorded and thus investigated. And he says um, this is not being complied with. Uh, but he also wants to know, uh, Rubber, uh, what did you mean about um, early expert uh, advice? So I, I answered that question on the chat, but in case- Oh, I did you? Okay. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. Very briefly, um, experts are important, um, if only in so far as, I mean, they're important broadly, but they are particularly important at identifying the indicators of trafficking that Catherine has set out in some detail um, and the application to your particular facts. So whereas your solicitors or counsel might not be able to persuade um, a CPS lawyer, a former police officer might be able to. Um, and dpp &M, the case Maya's already mentioned, has already recognized that um, the issue of trafficking is one that falls outside the expertise or common knowledge of a um, fact, factual tribunal, tribunal of fact, and therefore is admissible as expert evidence in criminal proceedings. Um, and that's how we get the um, conclusive grounds in now. And it's also how you get your um, ex trafficking experts in as well. So um, it, it's important in those areas. Um so uh, a question um, for you, Catherine. Um, uh, there's a first year GDL student who wants to know how much emphasis do the police CPS place on the psychological impact of being a victim of trafficking on the victim's decision making and therefore culpability? Um, I mean, this is a question that uh, any one of you could answer, but so I just picked on you, Catherine. Um, well, I think there's two, uh, sorry, the question was what weight is placed on it. 
Yeah, I think I think the questioner wants to know what sort of emphasis um, do I think it's a broader question probably about um, if somebody's psychologically impacted. Um, um, I think it's a reference to something that Rabba said. Um, I, I can see way, it. Yeah, about the way in which I think victims are perceived and whether uh, in making that decision that the sort of psycho the psychological impact of their trafficking may impact on that and, and whether any of the state bodies bear that in mind. Um, so it, from experience, answer is no, the police and CPS don't usually, uh, well, starting with the police, they don't usually um, recognise the psychological impact um, of the person's experience of trafficking on their ability to identify themselves. Um, so I think there are, there, there are, there are th and, and, and what should be done about that? How do you challenge that? There are three points. One, there are indicators, there are psychological indicators of trafficking, not just situational indicators that I've spoken about. Um, two, what are the impact of those indicators? The impact is that, as Shushan has said, there is a duty on the state to identify victims. The duty is not on the victim to self-identify. And the third is, as the court, um, and the court accepted in BCL, that there are clear barriers to disclosure as a result of the psychological impact of the trafficking experiences. Um, I mean, there's a fourth point about um, evidence and psychological evidence, but in, in my mind, just to say that usually at the first point of contact, sometimes there might be reference in records to client observed to be tearful, low mood, um, or you know, potentially placed on suicide watch, but that is not usually then factored in to an assessment of whether or not they've been trafficked or actually it doesn't trigger the thinking of this is a, an indicator of trafficking. I hope that answers that question. And in fact, it, it, it should trigger it. Yes. Um, I think a, a, an interesting question uh, next, uh, which is uh, from Tara uh, Mulcair, which is something that in fact, Shushan and I being sad, were discussing earlier this morning, um, the extent to which um, a criminal conviction needs to be quashed um, in order to bring uh, what she's described as a retrospective Article 4 claim against the CPS. Um, do you want to have a go at that, uh, Shushan? Don't pick on me. Don't pick on me. <laughs> um, well, we can both we can both grapple with that. Actually, I mean, yeah. I, I I think to to to, to kick it off, certainly, um, it, it's about which aspect well I would say we have to first work out which aspect of article um, four we're looking at and um, it would seem and you maybe have a different view on this but the way in which the Strasbourg court approaches article four is a slight blurring of the operational and investigative um, duty um, certainly with the investigative um, duty you don't have to show causation as it were you know um if we look at the application of dsd or in particular that the, if we look at the recent northern irish um case called c it was last year um what what we saw there were were damages uh, what, what what the court said was you don't have to have shown that the investigative failure had it not occurred would have resulted in a successful prosecution, for example, in a, for a victim of, of, of sexual violence. Yeah. Um, and so um, just, you, you know, applying that kind of thinking, what do you, what is your view on, on a sort of Article 4 claim where, where the conviction hasn't been challenged yet? Well, it's difficult, right? Because oftentimes it doesn't get challenged until a post-conviction identification, like in VCL. I mean, um, you know, VCL was done by one of our former colleagues um, who's now um, in the judiciary and, and her, her sort of t tenacity in trying, in writing what she felt very strongly was a, a, a significant wrong 
done to VCL was what got her, him the positive conclusive grounds decision in the first place, got him, um, got his first appeal reopened by the CCRC and got the second appeal going. And, and I think that um, I wonder from my, my, myself whether or not the issue of causation actually goes to damages rather than to liability. So if you fail to identify early, you fail to identify early, that's a factual matter that happened um, that you can't change. It may or may not have made a difference, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't constitute a breach, whether or not the breach is necessary for a compensation award to deal with just satisfaction is a different question. And I think for, for HRA damages, you still do need to show that causation to a certain extent in order to go beyond a declaration um, to show a compensation is necessary. So I think it, it's a question of compensation rather than um, liability and also, um, I was just thinking, could you be in a position not to be barred um, if, if you are taking steps to reopen? I mean, you know, it could, you know, loads of things have to happen before you can actually lodge a criminal appeal. Having worked with those who work in the criminal appeal context, you've got to first get them referred, you've got to challenge a negative reasonable grounds decision because inevitably something will go wrong. And then you've got to challenge something else. And, and then you've got to challenge a conclusive grounds decision. And then they have a protection claim and you want to wait for the protection claim to finish. And by the time you actually see the inside of the Court of Appeal in relation to the criminal um, case, it may be some years later, you know. I mean, VCL, the second one took you know, there was a gap of three or four years before um, it came to court again. And so I, I don't think it bars a claim, but I think, you know, factually it may influence the way in which the defendant runs its defense um, and it may influence the award of damages. Yeah, and there, there may be limitation issues, uh, of course, uh, as well, um, depending on what arguments you can make about when time started running. Um, mm -hmm. So um, I, I, I agree with you, if you, particularly if you want to recover damages in relation to the detention itself, you're going to have difficulties unless that conviction um, has been challenged. So we've got um, two minutes and I'm just going to um, ask... Um, there's, a, there's a question... Um, for Catherine, from an anonymous attendee, Catherine, is there a danger of arguments that the recognition of an operational duty to identify in paragraph 160 could be limited to the context of prosecution? That is to say, to guard against the prejudicial effects of non-identification, specifically where potential victims are defendants, as opposed to victims generally. So can we use any of it outside of the criminal context? Um, absolutely, yes. And the dangers identified um, of being limited to prosecution. This is a very, very old argument which has been defeated in a number of cases domestically and in Strasbourg. So you need to go no further than TDT, which was um, the application of the operational duty to potential victims, which relied on the Strasbourg case of JVL and Austria, and um, an MS Pakistan, which again defeated this argument um, that had been um, up, actually upheld in the Court of Appeal about Article 4 being the, uh, uh, limited, or at least in the investigative duty, to criminal cases. And the, the Supreme Court said, no, it's not. It's applicable anywhere. So... I don't think that, I think it's, as I say, it's a very old argument based on a mistake that um, trafficking is confined to criminal, there must, there's, it's a criminal activity. ECAT tears that away and uh, so do the cases, so no. <laughs> Thank you, that's a, that's a really comprehensive answer, Catherine, brilliant. Um, well, we've run out of time, we're exactly at 6.30 and I just, um, have a moment then to thank you all for coming um it's brilliant to have such so many of you here and to have such an interactive audience with so many questions what i do want to say is that i'm sorry we couldn't answer them all here today but just uh, you know if you have burning questions we're all here just ping us email us and we'd be really happy to help or we'll do our very 
best to help. Um, and lastly, and definitely not least, thank you very much to each of you um, brilliant speakers for sharing your insight and your knowledge and taking uh, giving us um, your time and also uh, thank you to both of you for intervening uh, for your respective charities um, Liberty um, and Anti-Slavery International in this case which we hope will have far-reaching consequences. Um, let's see uh, what our domestic courts uh, do with it. So it's uh, hopefully uh, onwards and upwards for victims of trafficking. Thank you all very much for coming.